Greetings, everyone. This particular workshop is called Sound, Physical Gesture, and Imagination. All three elements must be intertwined when students play the piano, like the threads of a beautiful tapestry. In order for them to have what I call artistic personality, we must think about all three components when we teach. We need to think of technique in terms of sound. To produce beautiful sound as well as musical line and phrase shaping, we teach appropriate physical gestures. Imagery helps our students to remember the physical gestures and they will also have more enjoyment at the instrument. So I'm going to start by playing a piece and I'm not going to tell you the name of the work. I'd like for you to just think about what you would title it or what would the piece be about? Oh goodness, I can't wait. Usually this is an interactive session, but right now it's not going to be. But I'd like for you to think about what it's like uh, when you are listening to this piece and what's going on. So what did you think while you were listening to that piece? Are you on a beach? Are you in a crowded city? Are you in a forest? Are you lost? Do you know where you're going? Oh my goodness, what's going on in that piece? Well, the composer of that work entitled Fire Mountain uh, is Martin Kutnowski, and that particular mountain is somewhere on the west coast of America. So that's on the first two pages of your Sound, Physical Gesture, and Imagination handout. So please, let's turn to those two pages. A while ago, one of my students was playing the D minor prelude and fugue from the Well-Tempered Clavier, and it just wasn't mysterious or ominous enough, the fugue. And I said, you know what? I said, I'm thinking about a character right now from one of my favorite books, and I would like for this fugue to be a little bit more brooding, a little bit more mysterious. And uh, I said, it's actually from a book called Wuthering Heights. <gasps> and my student nearly jumped off the bench. And she said, that's one of my favorite books and I know exactly who you're talking about. Heathcliff, he's so dark and brooding. He's one of my favorite characters. And instantly she understood how that fugue should sound. Scientists who have studied groups of people have noticed that people who have the most ideas, good or bad, actually were the most imaginative. And those that really didn't come up with any kind of imaginative ideas tended to be more matter-of-fact kind of drill-like drill, drill -like, uh, teachers. So it would probably be a good idea for us to put more imagery into our playing and into our teaching so that our students will have more fun at the lessons and can really understand what we're trying to achieve in both sound and technique. So another example of, of imagery is this past year, this past May, uh, quite a few of my students made it to state finals and one of them was playing the Rondo Toccata by Kavaleski. And of course, you know this piece, it starts like this. <music> And then the B section, which you all know, goes like this. So one of the judges at the final said, well, you know that section B, that grotesque 
section. You could make it even more grotesque. And my student and I laughed with each other when we were reading those comments because we thought, God, we don't think of that as grotesque at all. We were thinking of it as a happy bear <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> so really any kind of imagery will work if our student can tap into it and use it to make their piano playing better. So now let's take a look at page two and three. There's Fire Mountain in your handout. And then let's take a look at page four, which is a fantasy by Telemann. All right, so now let's see. I know and you know that this piece is definitely from the Baroque era. And it's very interesting for students to know that in the Baroque era, there really was only one mood throughout a piece. And early on, uh, musicians decide that there only could be six basic, what they called affections. And affections were really considered the spiritual movement of the mind. And these six basics were admiration, love, hate, joy, sorrow, and admiration. So I'm gonna play a little piece of this work and I'd like for you to think about what affection seems like this is. <laughs> So obviously that couldn't be hate. It could be love, it could be admiration, it could be joy, right? So there are many different ways to describe this piece. I had a freshman college student who once came into a lesson early on in her freshman year and I was playing a Schubert impromptu. It was very nice and light and happy. And I said, what is the mood of this piece? And she said, staccato. And I thought, oh, that's really cute, but that's not a mood, right? That's an articulation. <laughs> so there are two basic physical gestures our student needs to learn in order to play a piece like this well. The first one is a basic staccato, or in measure three. All right, and here the basic staccato is the student throws delicately or strongly into the keys, depending on what kind of sound you want to produce. Uh, and then the arm and the, and the hand comes up to its original starting place. So in succeeding at the piano, I have students think about the basic staccato touch release as a woodpecker touch release. So the woodpecker is pecking a tree and they notice that the wrist just goes along, along with the hand and the forearm. We don't wanna have a loose wrist when students are playing staccato and we also don't want to have tight wrists right we don't ever want to have wrists that are tight so we want the wrist to be flexible and the student listens for that nice crispy sound the other physical gesture the student needs to know is the basic drop and roll motion and the dropping and rolling motion is a very beautiful one that starts at the very beginning sessions with your students so we have the students drip <laughs> they drop and then they roll forward so we first start with this on this child's thighs in succeeding at the piano we drip we have the students drop by gravity. They notice that their forearm, their elbows, their upper arms, their hands all feel very released. Nothing is tight. And then they roll forward and off their thighs. So this particular motion helps students to understand the fluidity of all of their playing apparatus when they play. They get the idea of nuances within phrases, and they also learn how to play two, three, four, five note phrases with elegance, beauty, and with continuity. So in the second measure here, students can easily drop into the C, stay dropped, and then when they come up to this D, which is uh, one of the longest fingers, their fourth finger, They'll roll forward and then they will drop again and then roll forward. 
In measure four, they drop again. And then anytime they have a black key, they pretty much are going to roll forward and to the wood of the piano and then back towards their bodies and then roll forward and off the keys. So from the very beginning levels of piano teaching, we want our students to start to understand that basic physical gesture of a flexible, soft wrist and how using it helps to create musical phrasing. So of course we all know this beautiful piece by Brahms. just full of beautiful dropping motions and rolling motions as well. So now let's turn to page five of your handout, a study in 5-4 time. Oh my goodness, by Thomas Morley. Boy, oh boy, this particular piece was written way back in the Renaissance era. As I play it, I'm going to ask my student, my goodness, where are you when you're listening to this piece? Are you in the air? Are you on the ground? Are you below the ground? And of course, then your students can say whatever they think about in their mind when they're hearing that piece. It's very interesting that it's in 5-4 time. It helps students to make, um, helps make them, I'm listening to our dog bark outside. He's very excited. My husband built an obstacle course for him <laughs> and he's loving it. Our dog's name is Haydn ah, and his uh, playpen is called Esterhaza. So let's see, when our students think about, uh, about imagery, it helps them to become less nervous and it helps them to shape phrases more. So that's the beautiful study in 5-4 time. This particular book, On Your Way to Succeeding with the Masters, has wonderful pages on the history of every era as well as a wonderful practice strategy to learn and and little activities my goodness could you be a knight on a horse or would you be a boy on a bicycle during the medieval era <laughs> so the next piece i'd like to play for you is by a female composer on page 18. Uh, this is a minuet by dakart let's go ahead and listen to this piece So of course, when we're teaching this particular piece, that very first line is of nice long phrase. Right, with several high points of the phrase, like the A, and then to this G, and a little high point of the phrase at the last F sharp of the line, and then a tapering at the end of the phrase. So we could have our students sing it to get used to the phrasing. We could have them sway to the beat. We can conduct them through the piece so they understand their phrasing. We could also use count phrasing, where they count out loud. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. That way they won't play with strong beats always on beat one. One, one, one. Ugh, that is not musical at all, right? So count phrasing really helps students learn their phrasing. And also contour phrasing does as well. So you could have your student play any piece and you could draw what you think you hear is their phrasing. And it might be just like this, a complete straight line. And then they'll look at it and they'll laugh and they'll say, oh gosh, is that really what my phrasing sounds like? And then you can play a part of a piece and you can have them draw in your phrasing and they'll say, gosh, 
gosh, that was beautiful. All those little hills that go up and down, uh, hills and valleys. And last year for my June recital for pre-college students, I had everybody do a phrase map of one page from one of their pieces and boy, they were fantastic. They really listened to their pieces and they put in every little nuance, every musical shape to their phrases. They, some of them put them in color, others uh, just drew them very beautifully. So I suggest to you to have some good phrase maps going on in your studios. Okay, so now let's go on. We are in our handout on page six. The Rondo, oh my goodness, this is from Sonatina's book two, and this piece is by Atwood. It's the third movement, and actually since I can see it, uh, in this handout I don't have to use, I don't have to use my book. Hmm, it's big enough. So one of the great questions I ask my students is, what season do you think this piece is? Do you think it sounds like winter? Do you think it sounds like fall? Mm, what about summer? Could be, but I guess I think it might be spring. And then it goes back to the beginning section again. So also, <laughs> I have to laugh with you because one of my students who was using Succeeding with a Master so beautifully, uh, she was noticing that all of the piece's titles, my goodness, there's a gypsy dance, which has an interesting title. But otherwise, there are minuets, another minuet, another minuet. There was a scherzo in here. There was an andante, a presto, hmm, another andante, another minuet. A moderato, oh my goodness, there aren't very, they don't have very interesting titles. And my student said, you know, I love this music so much. She said, but the titles are really boring. And I said, why don't we make up our own titles? And she said, do you think we could? I said, of course. She said, do you think the, the composers would mind? I said, of course not, they wouldn't mind. They would love it. That just wasn't a trendy thing to do back then. So she was playing that wonderful, Bach minuet, and she said, I'm going to call that piece buying a new dress on Saturday. <laughs> and I thought, that is fantastic. And every time I teach that piece, I don't think of it as a minuet. I think of it with Emily's new title, buying a new dress on Saturday. Phrygian for a Leak is on page seven, and this piece is by a wonderful composer named Arthur Frackenpole. He's very well known for writing brass music, but he also writes fabulous uh, piano music as well. So Phrygian for a Leak, he writes, thanks, Edvard Grieg. And the reason why is because his lovely little ditty is inspired by In the Hall of the Mountain King, from Pierre Gintzweet by Grieg. So we all, we all know this piece. And I think it's really interesting how he has these two lines that are both nicely detached, very well articulated. The last line goes like this. So that little piece is in succeeding at the piano grade four. And the Phrygian Frolique, oh my goodness, this is from Portraits for Piano. Oh, my pencil dropped. Anyway, in this particular piece, there are so many different articulations that the student needs to listen to, as well as produce the right physical gestures for the sound. So you'll notice in the left hand, he has a mix of detached notes as well as staccato notes. And in the right hand, staccato. So I'm going to suggest to you, instead of having students play all staccato, like the basic woodpecker touch release, why don't we try a touch release called a kickoff? 
So a kickoff, the hand, the wrist, and the forearm all stay at the same level. The student starts on the keys and then they kick forward and off the keys. It's just like somebody kicking a ball. And this is another physical gesture that the student learns in succeeding at the piano. And of course, through all of my books that I've written, uh, especially pertaining to technique. So here we go. I'm gonna do that again. piece, isn't it? So sometimes I say to my students, let's change the music. Why did Mr. Frackenpole not want you to put the left hand with some nice legato phrasing? Because that sounds good too. And my students will think about it and think, my gosh, well, maybe it's because it's more contrasting with the B sections. Well, now that's a good reason why he has the beginning staccato. He was also inspired by Pierre Gint Suite, right? So maybe he wanted it to sound more like the Grieg work. We want to make sure that our teaching is not always telling students what to do, right? And instead, we want to have a very nice rapport, a dialogue with our students so that they can learn on their own and become their own teachers in time. So we do have to remember that teaching is not always telling. Now let's take a look at your handout on page eight with the piece, The Fifers. We can start off by asking our students, oh, what is the mood of this piece? Can you give me a descriptive word to describe it? So now let's talk about the four stages to learning every piece. The first stage is when a student can play either a line, two lines, three lines, whatever you work on in the lesson with them so that they have six days of productive practicing at home uh, with 100% accuracy in notes, fingering, rhythm, and articulations. Notes, fingering, rhythm, and articulations. And it's at uh, a slow thinking tempo. The second stage to learning any piece is when we add in pedaling, ornamentation, and we bring the piece up to speed. So this could be weeks, it could be months, right? Depending on the child, as well as um, the difficulty level of the work. The third stage of learning a piece is adding even more interpretation. So from the beginning, I do talk about this imagery that I'm uh, sharing with you today throughout every step. But on this third stage of learning a piece, I spend more time on the interpretation. And then the fourth stage of learning a piece is getting it ready for some sort of performance, whether it's a group class or a Christmas recital or the end of the year recital or a competition. And that, of course, uh, means memory work as well. So those are the four stages of learning a piece. So when we're playing this piece, we have a lot of nice staccato notes, and we also have a lot of two note and five note slurs. So that's the first two note slur we hear. And then we have a five note slur. So if we have students that have locked fingers and tight knuckles, So it's going to sound something like that, like no nuance in the sound and no real beauty. So instead, we want to make sure that our students understand the physical gestures that create these sounds. So you would think that is a nice, easy drop and roll, but this piece goes too quickly in order to have a slow drop and roll. So instead, we're going to teach the students 
a push off touch release at the end of the two note slur. And I liken it in succeeding at the piano to um, a kangaroo that's jumping off its hind legs and it's jumping forward. So we guide our students to move their wrist and forearm forward and off the keys and then their fingers just follow. The power comes from the upper arm. And in this particular five finger pattern, we're gonna have a dropping motion and then again, another push off at the end. And what do you notice about my sound? Is it loud to soft or soft to loud? This is soft to loud. <laughs> that sounds pretty funny, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's go and play loud to soft. So louder, soft, loud, soft. All right, so now we know the woodpecker touch release. We know the kickoff touch release where the wrist stays level and in line with the form and the hand. And now we have this wonderful push off touch release for also another staccato articulation where we want our students to feel a nice, um, beautiful feeling with their wrist being um, crispy and clean and moving forward and off the keys and for them to hear a crispy, bright sound. What else would I like to talk about with this piece? We have to remember that students should play on their finger pads and not encourage them to play with curved fingers on and playing on their fingertips. Otherwise, when they put their hands like this and they play, they have very locked fingers and wrist and uh, very curly fifth fingers, a lot of tightness, and they're actually playing from this knuckle joint, the middle knuckle joint, instead of from the top metal, uh, top knuckle joint, which is the metacarpal joint. So we want them to play from these joints. And if they do have that kind of supple, soft, flexible wrist, then they can also play on their nice finger pads as well. Staccato motions are mostly, if we can think of them as up motions instead of down motions. One teacher asked me, why do my students always sound like they're just playing in mud when they're playing staccato notes? It's because they're thinking too heavily right, and thinking down all the time. When we want any kind of staccato to sound like it's coming up in the air. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at machines on the lead on the loose, excuse me, machines on the loose. And this is on page nine of your handout. And let's see, I need to find it in this festival collection book. All right, this wonderful piece is by Kevin Olson. And we might ask our students, well, if you were to hear this piece played by other instruments, instruments in an orchestra, which instruments would be great at playing this piece? Our students could say, my goodness, I think it would sound great in the bassoon section and maybe with a big contra bassoon. Right? Others might say, well, the tubas would be really good, really, really good sound with this piece. And others might say, what about the double basses? That would sound really wonderful. So it's always a nice idea in pieces to think about, oh, what instrument could play this melody and which one could play the, the two lines in your bass melody, right? Anything like that so they can think about um, texture as well as sound. So in this particular piece, you notice I am playing all those two note slurs with a push off touch release. These are all kickoffs. 
So you notice that the sound changes as I'm using different physical uh, gestures. And these particular physical gestures I call touch releases because I want students to be aware of how they approach the key, how the, how the notes sound when they play, and then also their release from the key. So that's why they're learning that drip, drop, roll motion, the kick off, the push off, and um, next I'm going to teach you another one. So imagination is like flying a kite. First you have to run with it and then the kite flies up into the air. So you'll notice some of our students, you know, if we ask them, oh, what do you think this piece uh, sounds like to you? Can you give me an image, a description? And they might say, oh, I don't know. I don't have any idea. And that's okay. If we spend a lot of time talking about our own imagery, that's fine. But sooner, hopefully, rather than later, then teachers can let your students be engaged and give us uh, their ideas as to what a piece uh, means to them and how it sounds. So now we have the minuet in F on page 10. Wonderful piece by Mozart. And this is a great time to use visuals with our students. So usually I'll show them a fabulous castle that's almost disintegrating from the medieval era. And then I'll show them this marvelous Neuschwanstein castle in Bavaria, Germany from the Romantic era. And then I'll show them this beautiful classical era castle. And I'll talk about the symmetry and the simplicity of all those columns and the windows. So they understand that that's the most important part of classical music. Symmetry, simplicity, balance, so that everything is uh, just in the right place. So we can also, when we talk about our different senses that we can uh, help nurture, we can ask our students, well, let's see, when you hear this piece, does it seem bitter to you, sweet? Salty, savory, sour. by Mozart, my goodness. So when I teach Haydn, I spend a lot of time talking about characters in a castle, since he was at Esterhaza Palace. When I teach Mozart, I talk a lot about opera characters and who could be what in these special different phrases throughout the piece. And we spend a lot of time talking about physical gestures as well. So at the beginning of this piece, right, these are a bunch of woodpeckers. I might talk about bubblings, bubbling bubbles. I might talk about a trampoline because they, they move up and then they move down. When they get into this part, goodness well they'll have to tell you what kind of character is right there and what kind of motion is like this it's like they're bobbing up and down with nice soft flexible wrist and we know that this is a rebound staccato so rebound staccato happens in repeated notes and the wrist starts low and every time it plays is the next note it goes higher up into the space above the keys ah and that's why it's called a rebound staccato. And at the end here, a beautiful drop and a roll with both hands. One thing that I often do, actually every lesson practically, I'll ask my students about a particular practice strategy that we've been working on after they've been practicing something seven, eight times in a row, very methodically thinking about it. Uh, or if they've finished playing an entire piece, I might say, so were you satisfied with that? 
And on a scale from one to five, with five being the most satisfied, where were you? And they'll really think about it. And they'll say, oh, five, I'm really satisfied with it. And if they, said, if they say something like, well, maybe a three or a four, I'll say, let's do that one section over again. And they repeat it again. And I ask the same question. And they say, oh, yeah, now I feel a lot more confident. I'm more towards a five than I was before. And that's a good way for students to um, self-assess their own playing and uh, to make them aware of how fundamentally it is them that is creating this wonderful piece of music. And they have to work really hard in order to get it to sound wonderful for an audience. This next piece is Waves. This is by Emmalou Deemer. And this is a great piece for transfer students because they don't have to really worry too much about small little details. And it's very important for students to learn about this flexible soft wrist. This is unconventional notation. They can do whatever they want to do with it. They can start slower and get faster and louder if they want. Whatever, whatever comes to mind when they're thinking about this interesting notation. When I am having students play pieces like this where the wrist has to be very fluid, I often talk about an inner tube that can be around the stomach while they are just going in and out of the waves and in water. Because uh, that way they can relate to the motion as well as um, the impression of what it's like to be in water. So another question I'll ask in a piece like this is, what's the temperature? The very last physical gesture I made was a tissue box touch release. In succeeding at the piano, Chopin is pulling tissue from a tissue box. It's as if he heard something so beautiful and he has to go to a Kleenex, get a Kleenex to wipe his tears from his eyes. So the tissue box touch release is a very slow release so that the student can create a pianissimo, ethereal, wispy sound and the wrist comes first and then the fingers are like jellyfish below and then the wrist comes up as i said and the arm and the wrist excuse me the arm and the elbow just kind of hang there so beautiful part of debussy's reflections in the water students who are really locked up and nervous or you, uh, they want to get everything right and they don't have freedom in their playing apparatus, I'll have them exaggerate their tissue boxes at the end of phrases just to get that feeling of beauty and freedom. Rondo in B flat major. So this is on page 12 of your handout. And this particular piece is by Pleil. And Pleil was a very interesting character. He lived in Vienna. He studied with Haydn. He was a very good friend of Chopin's. He was known as a composer and a music publisher. And he actually published Chopin's 24 preludes for him. So this is a wonderful example of classical style with all the great symmetry and simplicity and balance between the right hand and the left hand. Uh, he was the 24th out of 38 children. <laughs> Glory be, can you believe that? 
So I'm going to play this piece and I'd just like again for you to think about the mood and maybe the image of the work. thinking to yourself, gosh, that's a terrific rondo, even though it's not really a rondo. But what could be another title for it? Right? What kind of characters, what kind of animals, what kind of colors can we see in this piece? So when a piece has a lot of fast finger work like this, I do a practice strategy called, called stop and check. And here the students will check for uh, whether their fingers and both hands are lining up exactly at the same time as they should, and what the balance is between the hands. So right there, I stop on that second beat. And I think to myself, yeah, my right hand is louder than my left hand, and they are lining up together. All right, now I'm going to stop any, any, anywhere else and listen for the same two points. Oh, that was good too. All right, and then you can tell your student, okay, why don't you go ahead and try another place to, to rest? Very nicely done. So you can have your students start at different places in the music and do that stop and check. Sometimes I call it stop and listen. So it means the same thing. Now, Metaphoric language always enriches the imagination. So let's say your students have a tendency to rush. Then I'll say something like, hold on to the reins. So they'll think to themselves, oh yeah, if I lived in the time of Playo, we wouldn't have cars, but we would have carriages and horses. So if I was playing this piece and I started to rush, I would say to myself, hold on to the reins. Da -da 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 -da. What and two and one. What and two and Another great way to make sure that students don't rush is to have them count aloud. Schumann said, the fingers must do what the head wills. And Michelangelo, Michelangelo said, the hand must obey the intellect. I love those quotes by those, by those wonderful, wonderful artists. Let's turn to page 13 of your handout. This is a lovely etude. And this is in the Etudes with Technique book four. So it is correlated with the Festival Collection book four, as well as Succeeding with the Masters volume two. So there's lots of different repertoire that the student can learn at the same time. So in this Etude, I use fabrics for the feeling and the sense of touch. So as the student is listening, to this piece, I will have them close their eyes and feel these different uh, fabrics. And I'd like for them to tell me then afterwards what they think this piece should feel like when, when somebody is hearing them play it. So here we go. <laughs> So the student might say, well, the way I play it, it kind of feels like this burlap. But I think that it might, it might be better if it's this nice satin kind of fabric. Ah, some of them will be too harsh. Some of them will be too sequiny, too, too bumpy. And so it gives them an idea of what the piece can feel like. So <laughs> students love to do this. And uh, one of the times that I did this session for a teacher's group, my fabric samples disappeared. Oh, a teacher took them. 
<laughs> so I think that they thought it was such a great idea, which it is, that they just stole the fabric samples, so I had to get more. <laughs> so when a student plays this piece, in order to get the sound that we want them to get, we want them to think about floating arms, so they have air underneath their armpits. <laughs> I'll say, can you imagine that your right hand and your right arm is um, a beautiful swan wing and the swan is just moving out and back towards the body. The left hand doesn't have that swan gesture. So they are doing two different physical motions at the same time. <clears throat> Uh, Mozart said, I want to hear that my music played fluidly like oil. I love that. And Chopin always said, let's play with a flexible singing wrist. All right, so now let's go on to the next piece, a minuet in G minor by Rameau on page 14. So when the student is playing this one, to that trill because I just thought of a friend of mine in New York City who loves to loves to text me when she's teaching and one day she was teaching a trill and she said to her student do you think that you could play a little uh, a little faster with that trill and the student looked at her and said well I, of course I could I would just have to practice more <laughs> isn't that just crazy <laughs> So would you consider this to be a dropping and rolling motion? Of course it's a dropping rolling motion, but the drops and rolls are reserved for slower music. So the moment that we have a faster release off the keys, that's a drop and a roll. But the other three note and two note slurs before it are actually push offs. Now, how can we get our students to really identify with this music? Well, they could give us a tour of their city. Oh my goodness. Wherever you live, you could say, what are some high points of the city that you would like to take a guest to? <gasps> How about if I do a tour of Paris right now? The first two lines would be acclimating uh, a guest to the streets of Paris. Maybe measure nine through the end of the first page would be going to some museums. <laughs> goodness why don't we stop and get a cafe and we're at a nice little bakery with cream puffs here we are at the Eiffel Tower and one of my students calls this a demolished chord instead of diminished What a great tour that was. And let's take a little bow at the end. So we're going to drop into the keys and roll forward and off the keys. So tour guiding is a very, very nice way for our students to think about their musical map of their piece. The boys round dance is on page 16. What kind of dance is it? What is a round dance? How old are the boys that are dancing? <laughs> Gosh, what excitement. In the middle of the piece, we have this. So we want to make sure when students play uh, arpeggios and scales that they don't reach or stretch for any keys. 
And we've seen lots of students with starfish fingers like this. As soon as they play a key, let them shift their weight to the next key. And then have them think about going over a mountain and then making a beautiful oval to the left and to the right and maybe pushing off at the end. If you have students that play a little bit too quietly, too timidly, uh, too shyly. I had a student once and I said, you know, I can hardly hear you. I said, why don't you be a wolf at the piano instead of a sheep? And she giggled and she said, yeah, I think I'd like that. <laughs> so in the beginning part, these are drops and rolls. This would be with a student who completely locks up their wrist and fingers. Do you hear the difference? Mm, not artistically played at all. How about a push off? That's nice for a student who is playing this piece at a slightly moderato tempo. If your students can play Allegro Vivace, then let's go ahead and have them incorporate a kickoff touch release. All right, and here at the end of the three note slurs, they're they are moving and sliding their wrist, hand, and forearm directly into the wood of the keys. Boy, is that fun to play. <laughs> All right, on page 18 is Daydreaming by Timothy Brown. And this is in book four of the festival collection. I think I need to get my book out because this is just a little too small for my eyes and in this gorgeous romantic feeling piece we want the students to voice the top melody out in D major for the second page. So let's have our students play the duet between the melody note in the right hand and the left hand. Counter melody. Think about where the high point of the phrase is. They can put big hearts above the high point. Play with nice flexible wrists. Then they could block. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? My goodness. And then when they're playing this pattern, it's actually a forward motion first. So it's a very gentle, driven push off. But we're not pushing off the keys this time. We're going to the next two notes afterwards. And coupled with that is a, just a constant fluid motion when the student has to roll forward, drop to their thumb, and then roll forward again. Now some students think that this kind of gesture always has to have a wrist and a elbow that makes a round circle. But what happens there? Then every note has the same sound and it's very uncomfortable to play. So I have descriptive words in index cards, a lot of descriptive words. And I use these intermittently in my lessons and they have all kinds of marvelous uh, words that students can think about how they want to play a piece. So this particular piece would be uh, beautifully played, of course. 
fearlessly played, it actually could be pretty fearless as well. So when the student is getting used to the piece, I'll have them pull out three cards that they don't even know that they're pulling out. They don't know what the cards are going to say. Okay, so let's see. I think I'm going to do one more that might be interesting to us. <laughs> okay, and with these three cards that they've chosen, they have to play each line in a different um, descriptive feeling. So the first line is aggressively. The second line, they pulled out the word calmly. And then the third card they pulled out was silently. And then you can talk to them about how does the different moods and the character words change, change your piece, right? And that gives us a really good conversation together. It also uh, makes our students who are ready to perform a piece uh, less nervous because they're enjoying being, um, being like a different character with every line. And uh, it makes them giggle and think about, gosh, uh, boy, our, my music can change so much by thinking of a different word and a different term. Okay, on the march on page 19, the only thing I want to say about this one <laughs> is that uh, I have a preparatory uh, department at school every time I teach piano pedagogy one. And a little beginner student came in and Every week I told my college students, I want you to play a more advanced piece for the little girl and we're going to talk about the composer and ask her um, the mood of the piece or what she thinks about the piece. And so one day, one of the college students played this piece. <laughs> And she asked the little girl, do you think that's a lullaby or a march? And the little girl said, well, that's definitely a lullaby. And we all looked at each other and we laughed just <laughs> silently. And afterwards we thought, wow, we're going to have to do a lot of work with this little new beginner student if she thinks that is a lullaby. <laughs> the romance on page 20 is by Glier. And this is in Festival Collection Book 5. I have to look at this one, too, because it's too small in this handout. What do you think this piece um, is portraying for the audience and the performer? Is it a silky sound, a hazy sound? Is it oily, slippery, wet, foggy, misty? <laughs> So the student needs to have a singing sound when they play this work. They need to shape the melody and mold the harmony so that the piece is really very beautiful. And that way the tone, the beautiful tone is achieved and the chords all must be voiced. You'll notice all of these chords when we're in the left hand. For a student that is not listening for voicing, you could have the student repeat a note like this until they get the sound that they want to hear. And I'll do the same thing at this high point of the phrase. If it's too quiet, have them repeat it da, da, until they create the sound they want. Uh, you'll 
notice that I'm using a lot of dropping and rolling motions throughout that entire work. Oh, that is just so beautiful. And the last piece I'd like to share with you today is an etude by Felix Le Coupe. In this work, we have not talked about the very important physical gesture of rotation yet. And I want to give you some good ideas as to how to teach it. So rotation is when the fingers, the hand, the wrist, and the forearm below the elbow all move from side to side in the same direction at the same time. This is also the quickest motion in a piano player's physical um, techniques. Uh, the other thing about rotation is that if it's taught incorrectly, then students can really get a tendonitis, a tennis elbow, and have thumbs that start to hurt. So it's really important for us to teach it correctly from the very beginning. When students are moving slowly from side to side, when they move to their thumb, that's called pronation, and when they're moving towards their fifth finger, that's called supination. So before I play this etude for you, I'd like to talk to you about a great way to teach rotation. So go ahead and have the students play an open fifth. Imagine that a magnet is right there at the tip of their fifth finger. They want to feel a nice strong fifth finger, a good arch, a nice keystone to this wonderful arch, which is going to be in the third knuckle of the hand. Then it's going to be like a drawbridge. They're opening the drawbridge and their whole hand will be on its side and the thumb is released and it's nicely uh, relaxed by the rest of its friendly friends, the other fingers. All right, and then we want our students to throw to the thumb and the F. Not throw to the thumb, throw their thumb to the F. And then they come right back up and their magnet keeps their fifth finger in place. So some students will be really tight, constricted. They'll be stretching and reaching like this, and they won't be able to get out of the keys without uh, feeling a great deal of, um, of uncomfortableness. And then when they can do that, let's do a double tap on the Fs. So here they're learning how to throw their weight into their thumb. It's nice and light. And then they can tap three times. <laughs> and the same thing with the left hand. The magnet is here on their fifth finger, uh, right at the tip of their finger, but still on their finger pad. And uh, the drawbridge is out. And then they throw to their thumb. They throw their thumb to the key and they come right back and they release any kind of tension they have. Then they tap twice. And when they come back, they have to release any kind of tension. learning this piece first, they could also play the duet between the hands, always singing the phrases out loud or in their head. So it's a nice long line of phrasing. We always want to feel that forward direction of the phrase so that it's a nice horizontal path or journey and not vertical because otherwise the piece will sound very chopped up and not very artistic. When the students are learning this rotation, 
they could imagine a boiled egg underneath their palm and they're just rolling their hand over back and forth. <laughs> they can also think of throwing their weight back to their melodic note. So it's the ap opposite of the drawbridge or the um, pancake flipper uh, where the students now are throwing their weight to the top of their hand. enjoyed this session today on sound, how to create beautiful sound and the articulations that every piece needs by using physical gestures and imagination. And I look forward to speaking to all of you about this topic and anything else when we get together.